kind of on my children. Do you realize how significant it is for our children to see their dads singing with them? Just give them a moment. And then all of a sudden, have something jump out at you that you've never quite gotten before. You just didn't get it. And all of a sudden, it seems so obvious. Such was my experience in reading today's scripture. We're all familiar with the many verses that talk about Jesus sitting at the right hand of God. Let me rehearse just a few for you, just to make sure you understand the emphasis here. In Luke 22, But from now on, the Son of Man shall be seated at the right hand of the power of God. Colossians 3.1 If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Matthew 26, Jesus said to him, You have said so, but I tell you from now on you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. <coughs> Hebrews 8, 1. Now the point in what we're saying is this. We have such a high priest, one who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven. And Hebrews 10, 12, but when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. And I could go on for about 90 more verses that say exactly that, that Jesus as our high priest and mediator and savior is now sitting at the right hand of God intercessing for us. In light of this very well-established fact of Jesus sitting at the right hand of God the Father, let's read this morning's scripture again with a little bit more critical eye. When the members of the Sanhedrin heard this, they were furious and gnashed their teeth at him. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God. And Jesus, standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, as if to underscore that fact, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Why? was Jesus standing. In the book of Acts, we learn how the members of the church in Jerusalem gave their money freely to the poor, but this had led to some problems. Logistically, as the church grew so fast, some of the widows of the poor were being overlooked and their friends made complaints to the apostles and the 12 apostles called the whole church together and they said it's not well that we should turn aside from preaching and teaching the word of god to sit the tables and give out money but brethren choose from among yourselves seven good men men who have the spirit of god and are wise and we will give this work to them so that we can spend our time in prayer and in preaching the gospel this plan was pleasing to all the church, and they chose seven men to take charge of the gifts of the people and to see that they were sent to those who were in need. The first man chosen was Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Spirit of God, and with him was Philip and the five other good men. 
And these seven men they brought before the apostles, and the apostles laid their hands on their heads, setting them apart for their work of caring for the poor. But as we go on and reading the story in Acts, we find that Stephen didn't just take care of the poor, he also started preaching, and he preached persuasively and powerfully, and he preached the truth of the gospel in an unvarnished way. And in so doing, he had occasionally, he, he stirred up the Sanhedrin against him. The Pharisees and the Sadducees were plotting against them, him. They had false witnesses set up to testify against him. And then he, he has a, a message that he shares that just blows them away and they're just so angry because he incriminated them with their shortcomings and failing to serve the Lord as they should. And so they set themselves upon him. And he becomes the proto-martyr, the first martyr of the Christian church. And as the stones begin to fall and pummel against his body and his head, as he's at that cusp between heaven and earth, a window to heaven opens up. And what does he see? He sees the throne of God. And there, the Son of Man, standing. Standing. Why did Jesus stand for Stephen? When we stand, it is a symbol of our honor. We stand during our worship service here when we read the scriptures, honoring the Lord in that way. We stand when we respect someone. We stand to honor. Why was Jesus standing for Stephen? I have some ideas. One is because Stephen was absolutely faithful to his calling. George Lucas' 2012 film, Red Tails, provides a dramatized version of the true events behind a group of World War II soldiers called the Tuskegee Airmen. Formerly, they belonged to the 332nd Fighter Group and the 477th Bombardier Group of the U.S. Army Air Corps. The nickname Red Tails was coined after the group painted the tails of their aircraft red. The Tuskegee Airmen were famous for two reasons. First, they were the first African-American military aviators in the United States Armed Corps. But the red tails hold a special significance in American history, not just racially, but militarily. In the European Air War, U.S. bombers were getting shot down at increasingly alarming rates. The problem arose when the enemy attacked fighter pilots who were protecting the bombers. They would leave the bomber to engage the enemy aircraft, and this would allow other enemy aircraft to attack the bombers in turn. And though this seemed like the obvious response, it was leaving the bombers vulnerable to attack. So each bomber carried a crew of 10 or 11 Americans. The Tuskegee Airmen were brought in, and they were given a different strategy. They were told, never, never leave the bombers, never. Regardless of what was happening around them, when the enemy attack, stay the course, defend your charge. As a result of their steadfast devotion, only 25 of the hundreds of bombers they protected during the war were lost. Their stellar reputation became legend. If you flew a bomber, you wanted the red tails with you. On the movie screen, the Tuskegee Airmen gathered around each other on the airstrip in a foreign land and shout their motto, the last plane, the last bullet, the last man, the last minute we fight. The Tuskegee Airmen are celebrated 
not just because they were excellent pilots, but because they never wavered from their duty. They never left their charge. No matter what happened, they stayed faithful to their calling. In 1940, Clarence Jordan founded Koinia Farm in Americus, Georgia as a haven for racial unity and cooperation. And in 1954, the Ku Klux Klan burned every building on the farm except his house. In the midst of the raid, Jordan recognized the voice of a local newspaper reporter. The next day, the reporter showed up for a story about the arson while the rubble was still smoldering. He found Jordan in a field planting seeds. He said to Jordan, I heard the awful news of your tragedy last night and I came out to do a story on the closing of your farm. Jordan just kept planting and hoeing. The reporter continued his prodding with no response from Jordan. And finally the reporter said, you've got two, H H you've got two PhDs. You've put 14 years into this farm and now there's nothing left. Just how successful do you think you've been? With that statement, Jordan stopped going. And he turned to the reporter and he said, you just don't get it, do you? You don't understand us Christians. What we're about is not success, but faithfulness. God stood for Stephen. Because of his faithfulness to the gospel, have we been faithful? Have we been that faithful? Honoring God also means bringing him the best sacrifice. In the book of Malachi, chapter 1, God is talking to his people and he's upset and angry because the people have begun to cheat him as they purportedly were honoring him with sacrifices. We read there God saying, you place defiled food on my wall. Because that's what they were supposed to do. They were supposed to bring offerings to the Lord. But you ask, how have we defiled you? He goes on to say, by saying that the Lord's table is contemptible. When you bring blind animals for sacrifice, is that not wrong? When you sacrifice crippled or diseased animals, is that not wrong? Try offering them to your governor. Would he be pleased with you? Would he accept you, says the Lord Almighty? And now, you implore God to be gracious to us with such offerings from your hands. We go on to read. When you bring injured, crippled, or diseased animals and other, offer them as sacrifices, should I accept them from your hands, says the Lord? Cursed is the cheat who has an acceptable man with his flock and vows to give it, but then sacrifices a blemished animal to the Lord. You see, they were saying they were going to bring the best, and then they brought the worst, what they didn't need, or what they couldn't sell or profit from. But we no longer offer God animal sacrifices because Christ has become our sacrifice. He has borne the penalty of our sin for all time, and our sins are paid for because of him. Having said that though, God is quick to tell us that in response to that great gift of his son, the only reasonable response is for us to give back to him as we live our lives, our very best. The apostle Paul puts it this way in Romans 12, offer God yourselves as spiritual sacrifices. This is the worship God desires. 
So the sacrifices we bring today are ourselves, our own lives. And God is still saying to us, give me your best. Don't give me leftovers. You know, I was thinking, how, how does that happen today? How do we give God the leftovers of our lives? I just thought of a few possible examples. For us today, using that Malachi uh, situation of the sacrifices that are being brought, what would a tainted sacrifice be? Well, perhaps when we spend an hour in an evening watching TV or reading a novel, and then three or five minutes before the Lord, before we fall asleep reading His Word. The tainted sacrifice might be when we bring our careers, our best energy, our best talent, our best motivation, but when it comes to serving the body of Christ, we sit on the sidelines. Tainted sacrifice might be when we spend a lot of money on ourselves for, a, for something that we want, and then when it comes to giving God an, an offering, we say, well, what's left of the budget? <laughs> Tainted sacrifice might be when we watch our favorite team make a touchdown, and we jump off a sofa in jubilation, we think, and worship, we passively just sit. Tainted sacrifice might be when we love our children so much that there's nothing that we wouldn't give them, but if we're honest in our heart, our heart doesn't beat as fast for all going to go. God says, don't bring me the second best. Don't bring me your leftovers. We make no apologies for out here at First Baptist when we challenge you to bring your best. I make no apologies when I say to get involved in what's happening here. <laughs> Roll up your sleeve. Use your talents. Use the gifts God has given you. Find a ministry here. Worship God enthusiastically. So we have to ask, have we, like Stephen, have we given God our best First Samuel, second verse, we read God saying, Those who honor me, I will honor. Pediatrician David uh, Kiera shares a story about how a little girl showed him at his church the honor, what it meant to honor God by serving. These are his words. One Sunday, my wife had prepared a lesson on being useful. She taught the children that everyone can be useful, that usefulness is serving God, and that doing so is worthy of honor. The kids quietly soaked up my wife's words, and as the lesson ended, there was a short moment of silence. A little girl named Sarah spoke up. Teacher, what can I do? I don't know how to do many useful things, she asked. Not anticipating that kind of response, my wife quickly looked around and spotted an empty flower vase on the windowsill. Sarah, she said, you can bring in a flower and put it in that vase. That would be a useful thing. Sarah frowned, but that's not important. It is, my wife replied, if you're helping someone. Sure enough, the next Sunday, Sarah brought again a dandelion and placed it in the vase. In fact, she continued to do so each week without reminders or help. She made sure that the vase was filled with a bright yellow flower, Sunday after Sunday. When my wife told our pastor about Sarah's faithfulness, he placed the vase upstairs in the main sanctuary next to the pulpit. That Sunday, he gave a sermon on the honor of serving others. Using Sarah's vase as an example, the congregation was touched by the message, and the week started on a good note. And during the same week, I got a call from Sarah's mother. She worried that Sarah seemed to have less and, uh, energy, and, uh, and she didn't have an appetite. Offering her some reassurances, I made room in my schedule to see Sarah the following day. 
After a battery of tests and examinations, I sat numbly in my office. Sarah's paperwork was on my lap. The results were tragic. Mommy. She had leukemia. On the way home, I stopped to see Sarah's parents so that I could personally give them the sad news. Sarah's genetics and the leukemia that were attacking her small body were a bad mix. Sitting at their kitchen table, I did my best to explain to Sarah's parents that nothing could be done to save her life. I, I don't think I've ever had a more difficult conversation than that one that night. Time pressed on and Sarah became confined to bed and the visits that many people gave her were all that she had in terms of staying in touch with the church. She lost her smile, she lost most of her weight, and then it came, another fall, telephone call. Sarah's mother asked me to come see her. I dropped everything and ran to the house. There she was, a small bundle that barely moved, and after a short examination, I knew that Sarah would soon be leaving this world. I urged her parents to spend as much time as possible with her. That was Friday afternoon. On Sunday morning, the church started as usual. The singing, the sermon, it all seemed rather empty when I thought of Sarah. I felt enveloped in sadness, and at the end of the sermon, the pastor suddenly stopped speaking. His eyes wide, he stared back at the church with utter amazement, and everyone turned to see what he was looking at, and it was Sarah. Her parents had brought her for one last visit. She was bundled in a blanket and a dandelion in one hand. She didn't sit in the back. Instead, her parents slowly carried her in front of the church where her vase was still perched by the pulpit. She put a flower in the vase and a piece of paper beside it. Then she returned to her parents. Seeing little Sarah place her flower in the vase for the last time moved everyone. At the end of the service, people gathered around her and her parents, trying to offer as much love and support as possible. I could hardly bear to watch. Four days later, Sarah passed. I wasn't expecting it, but our pastor asked to see me after the funeral. We stood at the cemetery near our cars as people walked past us and in a low voice he said, Dave, I've got something you want to see. He pulled out of his pocket a piece of paper that Sarah had left by the vase. Holding it out to me, he said, you better keep this. It may help you in your life work. He opened the folded paper to read in pink crayon what Sarah had written. Dear God, this vase has been the biggest honor of my life. Sarah. The doctor concludes Sarah's note and her vase have helped me understand. Now I realize in a new way that life is an opportunity to serve God by serving people. And as Sarah put it, that is the biggest honor of all. As Jesus puts it in Luke 12, from everyone who has been given much, much will be demanded. And from the one who has been entrusted with much, much more will be asked. Have we honored Jesus by how we have served him, by what we have given him, and by how we have shared his gospel? I wonder, as we have our annual meeting today and present our 177th annual report if Jesus is listening, and I'm sure he is because he cares deeply about each of his churches. We know that from the book of Revelation. Oh, if only we could look. 
look into heaven like Stephen looked into heaven and see. As we recount what we have done and what we hope to do, to see if Jesus is standing. Let's pray. Gracious Lord, we seek to honor you. In Jesus' name.